Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Zone Star State Podcast. I'm Matthew Bruni, and joining me once again is Ishmael Johnson. Ish, how are you doing today? Coming off of your ESPN Plus debut. <laughs> good, good. I'm in Austin right now. I'm about to head down to San Antonio for the Girls State Championships, doing some more broadcasting down there, uh, particularly on Saturday uh, for the finals. But it was cool, man. Uh, College Park Center is a great venue. The, the crew there was awesome. Um, I haven't done – that was like my first – like tv crew mm-hmm. in like five years you know working with so it's it was interesting trying to talk to producers in your ear and like have them kind of talk so it's a different setup than i'm used to but it was a lot of fun man um it was a good game too it helped and yeah um it was it was fun it was fun yeah i i could not do that i i don't know i mean i feel like i could like as far as like giving out the information you know yeah, be yeah, like yeah. all right this this and this but then you get into like you said the producer and you're, you're bouncing off of another person i'm ah, not that talented it helps that uh, uh shout out james tridley who's done some games for us on text and live um he's really good you know he, mm-hmm. he he's uh one of the best young broadcasters out there right now um it helps he's very good and he's 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 easy he's easy to bounce off of and so um once you get the cadence down because like I've, i i did college radio in in college um mm-hmm. and so that's a lot more regimented like they always tell you like from when the basket when the ball goes in the basket to when they bring it up to half court that's like the color commentator right and then you give it up mm. as they're you know to the play-by-play guys the play goes around tv's a lot more interactive than that because like the, the the fans can see what's happening so like you don't need to like relay what just happened every single time so it's it that one's a different uh more of a i don't want to say struggle but more of a challenge so it definitely it, it took me a couple um minutes to kind of get it going you'll notice if you go back and watch it you'll know that i'm like probably like trying to figure out exactly when to when to kind yeah. of come in and when to yeah. when to shut up yeah um well let's, let's i mean real quick i mean what did you think of yeah. Utah Arlington now ten and seven uh, in conference play are obviously a really solid team. We weren't sure what they were going to be coming into the year, but uh, get this win now three straight. Yeah, uh, they clinched the clincher spot in the uh, the WAC tournament, which is massive for them. Um, they're they really are a fun team. Like they, I in my research, I guess I didn't re- realize how much differently they were playing in terms of stylistically they are the number one team pace wise in the conference. They're a top 30 team tempo and pace wise in the country. They get out and run. Um, They're all about turnovers. And they actually, the one thing that I do enjoy is that they're a good rebounding team. They're the best rebounding team in the WAC and not just Shamar Wilson, who's kind of their, their main rebounder. Dejuan Gordon at guard is a stellar rebounder. I think he's either leads the conference or is in the top three in double doubles as a guard. Um, and he kind of initiates everything. He he's able to. He's not their point guard, but he is a lead guard in terms of the game. Kind of goes similarly, not in the same capacity, but similarly how Jamal Shedd runs Houston both mm-hmm. offensively and defensively. He's kind of that initiator a lot of the times where the fast breaks usually start because it's a steal from him, and like he kind of gets things yeah. going. He kind of finishes fast breaks. Um, and they're an outside shooting team. They're a fun team, and I, I really did enjoy watching them utah tech kind of punched them in the mouth early on um they came out to an early lead uta got up to tied it at halftime and then afterward <clears throat> in late mid second half they kind of pulled away but that's going to be a fun team to watch just because it's an experienced team a little bit so like not all these guys are going to be back but yeah. you have guys like like i mentioned with dejuan gordon i think makai williams was an incredible find um as a, as a freshman he's gonna be somebody to watch going forward and i'm just i think this year kind of showed me that K- kt turner knows how to bring talent and he's not he's not limiting them to just like the dfw area or even texas makai williams is a freshman from california mm-hmm. um uh, Philip uh, Russell Phillips is from, um, or excuse me, Philip Russell um, is from St. Louis, right? Grad transfer. Yeah. Um, Brandon oh, Talbot's from Toronto, right? So like a lot of these guys are from everywhere. Uh, Kate Douglas is one of their only uh, guys from Texas, Darius Miles as well. So like, it, it just shows that like, I think he's able to use his wide reaching recruiting ability to kind of bring whatever he needs to Arlington. So um, it, it's not, it wasn't an easy job. We talked about that, right? Greg Young, it was kind of a weird situation with Greg Young, right? He mm-hmm. wasn't really 
the right guy. And I think it showed me making the tournament in their first year and potentially getting a first round buy um, is a massive step for, for what they got cooking. Yeah. Um, three games left, uh, Seattle and Utah Valley on the road and then Cal Baptist at home. If they could just win one or hey, if they win two of them, I mean, 12 and eight in conference would be outstanding. Like you said, the the stats, the numbers, like when you pull up Camp Palm, it's yeah, number one in, in offensive tempo, number one in three point of field goal attempts, number one in assist rates, like number one in effective field goal percentage. So very, very fun I'll team. Say, yeah. Team. I'll say this to anybody who wants to just throw on a game, like they they're a team that like they will try to dunk it down your throat. Like <laughs> there were like three different attempts where <laughs> I think one of them, Shamar Wilson. I think it was Shamar Wilson. Uh, he don't he like jumped from like the what you know how there's the free throw line and there's like the logo yeah. and the 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 conference logo and mm-hmm. then the best. He like tried to jump from like the 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 conference logo and like yam on someone. Um, Makai Williams, who's not a big dude, he's like six foot maybe. Uh, tried to cock it back and like dunk on Utah Tech's like seven footer. <laughs> like, it was, and it wasn't close. Like it wasn't like a close. Like oh, he's right under the rim, right? He's like from a good like a slam dunk contest distance. Yeah. Away. He's like let me just let me just try to go for this. Um, but they're just so aggressive. And so again, they're not the most successful team right now. They're still trying to work things out. But they play with so much freedom and so much uh energy that you can't help but enjoy watching them um and even when they were losing i was like this team's gonna make a run and sure enough like utah southern uh, utah tech isn't very good this season i still think they're actually kind of talented but um yeah. they blew them out of the water in the second half and now right now i think they're sitting at fourth um they're a one game out of the third slot for anybody who's curious we can talk about one of the top two teams at the top the top yeah. two teams get a a bye to the semifinal and then the the third and fourth seeds get a bye to the quarterfinal and then everybody uh five through eight have to win four games in four days to win the conference so those those top four seeds are so valuable and so if they're able to hold on i think they have a half game lead they have a one game lead over utah valley in that four seed so if they're able to hold on to that that's a massive massive step um to potentially making a run to the semifinal or something yeah uh, like you said, um, we have a shakeup at the top of the conference right now. Grand Canyon is now tied in the loss column with Tarleton State. Grand Canyon is 14 and 3 in conference. Tarleton is 13 and 3. They obviously split the two games, but we have to give a shout out to Abilene Christian. Brett Tanner Brett and Tanner, Abilene baby. Christian beat Grand Canyon at home 79-73. Um, we were hoping we were like, you know, who is it that's going to take down Grand Canyon one more time? So Tarleton has a shot at this thing. And it was Abilene Christian, 242nd in Ken Palm, came through and beat the number 62 team in Ken Palm at home. Um, yeah, shout out Abdul Diba, uh, for Abilene Christian. We've talked about this team. They, I, I mean, they're one of the more disappointing teams, I think, in the of the year. Like, remember yeah. when they beat Oklahoma State to start the season? We're like, wow. This is it. This is the yeah. team. You know, Brett Tanner's got them. Yeah, they've they've been underwhelming. Twelve and fifteen overall, seven and nine. But they've now won four straight, including a win over Grand Canyon. So, shout out to Abilene Christian for for doing the job. And now we have, uh, I mean, you make Grand Canyon sweat. You make them sweat these last four games or last three games out where they got. Uh, I'm granted RGV will be an easy one, and then mm-hmm. uh, SFA at home should be a win for Grand Canyon. But then you go to Cal Baptist. So, yeah. hey, if they slip up again. Tarleton will be right there. Right yeah, there they're only a half game up on Tarleton right now. Um, Tarleton does have the tougher stretch, right? Yeah. But we also talked about that before they before Grand Canyon lost to ACU. Um, I think they have a tough Utah game, Utah stretch coming up against um, on the road, and then they welcome Seattle, which is going to be the really tough game to close the year. Tar- I'm talking about Tarleton. Um, but again, like you mentioned, we didn't expect Grand Canyon to lose to. ACU, so we'll kind of we'll kind of see how it plays out. If they're within punching punching distance, regardless, it looks like they'll both hang on to uh, that that number one and two seeds. So, regardless of who wins the regular season, as we know, like the tournament's what matters because you know mm-hmm. that's what gets the automatic bid. And and so we'll see if uh, we'll see who wins the regular season. But it all, I mean, these two teams are poised to face each other again in the championship game. Yeah. All right, let's move over to the Big Twelve. 
because it was another busy week. But really, I think just from Houston's perspective, this is really where um, it was interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. Houston beat Baylor 82 to 76. Um, also, Baylor, we'll talk about it a little bit more last night. Baylor beat TCU um, by eight, and it wasn't even that close for a lot of the game um, in yeah. Fort Worth. So we can talk about both of those results. Houston is now the number one team in the country in the AP poll after uh, UConn lost and um, Purdue, I think, struggled or something like that. But yeah, Houston over Baylor in, in overtime, 82 to 76. I thought um, this was like the LJ Cryer comeback game, obviously, right? We talked about mm-hmm. how much he struggled, and I should have just, you know, taken the over on whatever his points was because we knew he was going to come out and try to beat Baylor. Uh, getting booed every time he touched the ball, ends the game with 15 points. Um, still, you know, I, I, did, this doesn't answer really any of my questions, but it was at least good to see him make shots because that's all this team needs him to do is make shots. Yeah. I was about to say, like, that's it really is because you, you look at what, um, how they were able to beat Baylor and it was kind of how they built out that early lead, right? Um, they didn't finish the game very strong, but that strong start was good enough to kind yep. of make Baylor play catch up. Um, they really, I think it was like what, like 15 to two or so. It was some early, some crazy early start for them. Um, yeah. And so Baylor was playing catch up the whole time. And that's an advantageous, advantageous position because then you, even if the offense stalls out for Houston, they still got to score on the other end, right? And Baylor was able to, but that's Baylor. That's one of the best offenses in the country. That's not a luxury that's going to be given to any other team, um, most teams even. And so it didn't really uh, – I think it really proved to me that, like, Houston's defense is getting back to that we're just this good level, right? Um, that they kind of – I don't want to say lost, but kind of took a little bit of a ding after the loss to Kansas. Um they're getting back to that. We're just that much better than you level of stinginess. And so even when Baylor was able to work their way back into it, at least it it appeared to me when that game went in overtime, it appeared to me that like Baylor kind of exhausted everything, just getting back into the game. And then by the time overtime came around, Houston was like, all right, cool. Like now we can kind of, you know, they're kind of tired, right? They've been, they've been going at us for this whole time. And we, they're now we're conditioned for this, right? Because how we play on both ends of the floor. And I don't want to say Baylor's not conditioned, but just Baylor, I think Baylor just gave it all trying to get back into the game. Yeah. That by the time it got to overtime, they were drained. Yeah. And Eves Massey has a free throw to essentially win the game. I mean, to take a one yeah. point lead with three seconds left and he misses it. And then Jamal Shedd comes down and hits hits a three to win it. But it's I was about to say it looked like it, man. That was close. Is on his fingertips and uh, doesn't end up counting. So we go to overtime. Um Juwan Roberts, though. Like there were two standout players in this game, and yeah, jo- Jawan Roberts ends the game seventeen points, eight rebounds, four assists, three blocks, and six steals. Like in in forty he minutes, was, obviously. He, uh, he frustrated. He his Masi was frustrated in that first, the first half of the first half. Like Jawan Roberts had him in his pocket the entire that entire. I mean, period. The entire game. I mean, he's Messi ends the game with two points. Those are those only two points. That's the a last good point. Yeah, he did only game. score those two, right? Wow, two points. I mean, it, it felt like he was in the play a lot, but like, yeah, thirty-three minutes, two points. This was a masterclass by not only uh, Jawan Roberts, but I think Javier Francis was tremendous too in his twenty-two minutes. Like he was kind of everywhere um, as well. I I like Tugler obviously. Like the front mm-hmm. court, it's amazing how much I we've come around on the front court of this team, uh, even with, you know, Arsenal leaving, um, or I'm sorry, getting injured. Um, but like, I have no more questions about the front court. They seemingly shut down everyone they play. It's like Dickinson, Messi. It's just doesn't matter what you have. Houston just takes it away. I think I underestimated the steps that Juwan Roberts was going to take offensively. Um, yeah, because there were points where he's so comfortable with his back to the basket now. And like there were some like the fact that they're able to throw it to him and say, yeah, just go at ease Missy. And it was like, oh, OK, he's just going to do that. Right. He's going to get a little jump hook. Boom. Over the minute. It's like he didn't have that last year. You know, like there were some things that I underestimated about this, this, this front court for sure. Size, obviously size is one of them. That's always going to be something every year with Houston. But I think their conditioning, I completely underestimated because like you mentioned, you name three players and guess what? That's their front court. 
Like that's just, that's just it. Right. They rotate those guys. Sometimes it's one, sometimes two and that's it. Right. Uh, and man, they're able to, even with just Roberts and Francis, that defensive front court right there, even not even throwing in Tugler, like that's the best yeah. in the country, the, the tandem right there. Not only is that their front court, but those are like the only players over six, three on the court at all times. <laughs> <laughs> like we got six, one crier, six, one shed, you know, six, three sharp. I mean, Dunn is listed at six, five. I don't, I, I don't, when I watch him, I don't feel like he's six, five, but sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, Houston is awesome. And then we get to the other J. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, like, it, it, it really, it's really frustrating to me that uh, Zach Eadie's back because he's just going to win player of the year again, even though yeah. Jamal Shedd should be firmly in that conversation. Um, I believe Ken Palm has him in that conversation, but it's it's numbers-wise, everything like, it's going to be Zach Eadie again. Um, yeah. And there's also history. Like, he'll be, I think he's going to become the first back-to-back since Ralph Sampson. And so, like, there's some big history there potentially with him, but it's like, I don't know, man. It feels like people are really underestimating the the two way season that like somebody like Jamal Shedd is having. Yeah. Um, and then on the Baylor side, Jacoby Walter has become the best player on the team. Just yes. Flat out. I yes, I don't know what guy. lock top ten pick everything for me scores twenty three points against Houston five of ten uh, from three. Uh, the three point shooting of this team has become really, really, and they've always been able to shoot. Like, I don't want to sound like this is a new thing. We knew, we know they could shoot the damn ball, but like even against TCU and we can transition in that game a little bit, mm-hmm. Jalen Bridges comes out and hits, goes three for three or four, no, four for four to start the game. And so now you have Walter, you have Bridges. And I, obviously we know Dennis is capable and none is capable. And so the three point shooting of this team immediately makes them a dangerous offense. And once Eves Missy can get going, like he had 16 points against TCU on 609 shooting, much better matchup for him. You have the inside out presence. You have Ray J. Dennis at point guard with nine assists. I mean, that's what this team kind of is in theory. Like whenever you 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 picture them offensively, it's like Walter hitting, Bridges hitting, Dennis point, Missy inside. Um, Dennis ended with nine points, nine rebounds, nine assists. Pretty mm. fun game from him. But yeah, that that's what this team should be. Right. And I think for me, they were, when I saw them against Texas Tech, they were a team I was watching and I'm like, these aren't bad looks, right? They just weren't falling. And since then, I think, except for the BYU game where they kind of hit a, hit a, a, a speed bump, yeah. they've been shoot, they've finally been hitting on those shots that they've been missing. Cause when you saw their numbers in conference, the three point shooting went down, like success, success wise. They were, they came into the year or came into conference play, I should say, as Mm -hmm. one of the best three-point shooting teams in the country. But then they kind of hit a wall and kind of became like average. But then since that Texas Tech game, again, except for that BYU and I think maybe Kansas, every against Houston, against TCU, against Oklahoma, like they've been hitting again. And I mean, for them, like, I wouldn't be sure. Again, tournament time's weird, right? All these teams are getting in in, in the NCAA tournament. Big 12 tournament wise, I don't know who I'd pick in a one-off in this tournament, right? Like Baylor could theoretically win the big 12 conference uh, in tournament. And so because of now they're hitting from three, right? BYU is another team where it's like, I probably could see them catching hot. I would love to see BYU play Houston again. Cause I do think like BYU's played a lot better since then. Uh, Houston ran them off the paint that one time. So I would love to see that matchup again, but like, I don't know what to think about BYU right now heading into the tournament, but Baylor hitting, like we see teams that shoot this well, catch teams off guard in one-off scenarios. And the last, what is it? The last six games, they haven't even had Langston Love. So yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah. And Langston Love, for those who don't know, and I honestly didn't even know it was this high, shooting 49% from three on the season and was 17 of 32 in conference play from three before he got injured. So yeah. he was questionable last game, didn't play. We'll see uh, what his status is moving forward, but you get him back. For tournament play i feel a lot better because the depth of this team I, like the depth isn't great they played mm-hmm. six players pretty much against tcu but um you add him back in the mix and it takes a lot of pressure off of like none and and walter yeah. and so, so. Well, i was gonna say like when it comes to tournament time like depth kind of stops mattering at a certain point right mm-hmm. like once you start getting in obviously one play more than six but like teams don't typically play more than like eight when it gets to tournament time and so having that reliable handful 
isn't a bad thing, right? It's it, depth is how you get through the season. But then once you get through the season, you have your core. And so if they get Langston Love back and get that to maybe seven, okay, then I think that's a team that could potentially make a second weekend or something. Um, real quick before we move on from the Big Twelve, yeah, I think Texas is officially on bubble watch here. If well, first of all, last four games here, so they're six and eight right now in conference. Yep. Last four games at Texas Tech, home against Oklahoma State, at Baylor, home against Oklahoma. In theory, I think that's like two and two most of the time. Like you're two and two, get out of it eight and ten. Eight and ten, I think they get in the tournament. The problem is if they go one and three in this stretch. And in yeah. seven and eleven, they don't have a non-conference win to speak of. They don't have a non-conference win over a tournament team. I mean, really, they don't have a, their best win is against LSU. And LSU is eighty ninth right. in Ken Palm, right. and outside of that, it's Rice almost. Like that's what we're talking about here. They have really have no other wins to stand on besides their conference wins. So if you only have seven conference wins, you really only have seven wins for the season, as far as I'm concerned. So. Yeah. You have to at least beat Oklahoma State and Oklahoma at home. You can lose Tech and Baylor on the road, but you have to go two and two. If not, I am very worried that they're going to miss the tournament. I think so. I am too. Um, I mean, they got embarrassed by Kansas, just flat out embarrassed. <clears throat> they're showing like, I don't know. I thought they kind of figured some things out with their rotation and all that. And like, I, it, it just comes back to me. I still think this is the best rotation they have. Um, yeah. I don't have any more like on court <laughs> criticisms of no, this team. No, no. I, I just think this is what they are, right? They're a team that's not going to compete for this conference as far as the top of it um, and may get left out of the field. Yeah. Like you said, like, look, Texas Tech, there are photos of Texas Tech students sitting out waiting for tickets now, <laughs> which again, if you don't think, or sorry, last night, we're recording on Tuesday. So yeah, it's tonight. Yeah. Uh, there was tickets, there are photos of students sitting out on Monday. Um, if you don't think that place wants to send Texas to the SEC with a sweep loss on yeah. their back-to-back, their last year in the Big 12, you're kidding. So that's going to be one of the hardest wins, the hardest games they've had all year. <clears throat> they got Oklahoma State to, okay, should be, should, 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 should be, a win. be a win. We'll see. Yep. Then you go to Baylor. You go to the the, the Foster for one more time, and they're going to want to send you off with an L. And then you host Oklahoma, which, again, they beat Oklahoma earlier this year. Should they be favored in that one? But you never know. Oklahoma's not bad. Nope. So I would say, yeah, I would have went into this year, or, yeah, probably this year, two and two, saying, now I'm like, one and three is right there, man. Like, <sighs> one and three to, fin- to finish the year is right there. Um, yeah. It, I forgot I how bad they're not. I forgot how bad their non-conference was, honestly. Yeah, I know. I, I didn't realize either until you said LSU was the best one that they had. So, that's, and I was there disgusting. for that game, and they allowed LSU to score eighty-five points, and that was not fun. Um, Let me see. I'm gonna take a quick glance at the bracket, real quick. The the Big Twelve bracket, because I don't know how that's see the break. While you do that, I do also yep. want to mention Texas Tech has lost two out of three. Um, well, the Iowa State lost on the road. I, is what it is. Beat TCU right. at home and then lost to UCF on the road last night. Without Warren Washington, I don't know what they're capable of. And I think Warren Washington's sure. going to be back soon. But, like, without him, this is not the same team. So, the, right. the margin for error of this team, we like, they've already, like, exceeded expectations. You take away Warren Washington, I don't see, like, them doing it. But they still have four games left. Should be able to get him back and, and get all right. So let's see, looking at it right now, Texas would have the 10 seed and they'd play seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's BYU, like in the first round. Are you kidding me? Like, yeah. <laughs> like what? <laughs> and let me see, they're, uh, they're within a half game of Kansas State at nine. Okay, maybe. And that would still get them. I mean Oklahoma, like that's not like right now they're not they're in an awful spot for this tournament. They may go one and done in the tournament. Yeah, and if that happens, then we're really, really talking about I don't know what this. Is I was about they, they I was about to say they need to go at worst two and two, but then win maybe a game or two in the tournament to make the, yeah. to be like solidified in the field. Um, I'm looking up. Real, hold on one second. Because I want to make sure I got Warren Washington's timetable right. Because I think he yeah. 
He did. He returned. He made it 13, played 13 minutes last game against UCF. Okay. So he's coming back. So he should be back full strength at some point soon. But yeah, 13 minutes. We'll see um, if he can get on the court for the entire game uh, against Texas tonight. Okay. okay. Um, anything on the top of your mind here? Uh, Big 12 wise or? <clears throat> no, just anything wise. Anywhere you want to take it. I have a few more. Uh, I mean, we joked about it off. Off. You want to talk about the AAC a little bit? I was just opening the door. If you wanted to, t- if you wanted to go there, if you wanted to go there, we can go there. All right. So, uh, what happened with what happened with North Texas? <laughs> Jesus, one of the worst days of the year for me. Um, <laughs> North Texas loses to UTSA. Gosh, where are they on Ken Palm now? North Texas, are they even. Let me control F North Texas on Ken Palm now. I was about to say, it's been a while. I had to scroll down. Oh, drop down to 84th in Ken Palm. Um, okay. Okay. Two things. All right. <clears throat> Two things. I think this, this speaks to this UTSA team should not be this bad. We talked sure. about no, it. I think that, I think we've I've come to terms with this UTSA team is actually pretty talented. It was annoying watching this game. <laughs> Because like UTSA didn't go away, but at the same time I'm like, yo, Jordan Ivy Curry is a freaking killer. Yeah, this dude. Is, I mean, 21 points. North Texas had no answers for him. Jordan Ivy Curry. Um, I'm like, okay, you have Jordan Ivy Curry. We've known about Christian Tucker, who I've I've liked, but then you go Carlton Lingard, one of the best, like, one of the most versatile offensive seven footers in the state, flat out. Shoots the three mid post, like everything. Carlton Lingard mm-hmm. is an awesome. Like, he was the one who his agent put out his film and been like, he's on like only a junior, blah blah blah. And he was like, yeah. you know, basically saying like he could transfer after the year or something like that. That's mm-hmm. a guy who could like play at Memphis or something like that. Um, and then you go down the list and you're just like, all right, how is this team this bad? And it's annoying because North Texas. I thought actually played a pretty solid like first half and then in the second half couldn't pull away. And then UTSA goes on a run, hits like three straight threes and takes the lead and wins the game basically. And you're like, what just happened? And um, I mean, I think it is an indictment on North Texas. They had Ruben and, and now Ruben Jones and CJ Nolan, two as the guards who they've been without basically the entire conference uh, made their return for this game. And in mm-hmm. theory, that's great. Uh, but also, it was very clear, like, figuring out how to play with two players. Like, basically, you're starting backcourt back Yeah, is a different, like, you know, it's hard to figure that out. And so John Bugs only attempted one shot. Like, this, it's, this, the staggering was off. And so, right. um, no excuses, though. It's a bad loss for North Texas. I, as a North Texas fan, am very annoyed. I had to listen to my dad call me and get on me about because he's a UTSA grad. For those who don't know, oh, okay. a UTSA <laughs> grad, and he just was like, "Yeah, what happened? I thought this was the one sport y'all could beat us in." Da 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 da. And so, anyway, he, he also, yeah, yeah, he also. I mean, when the women's team beat North Texas, he also was like, "Oh, da 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 da." This is three zero this year. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. Ooh. Not good for basketball school in North Texas losing to UTSA. Oh, I, I didn't want to. I will say I did enjoy. <clears throat> I did enjoy uh, uh, Greg Luca from the San Antonio Express News put out a, a story. Uh, let's see, UTSA men's basketball faces uncertain future with uh, Steve Henson's contract about to expire, and in there is a quote from Lisa, Lisa Campos as my cat knocks over my remote. Uh, let's see, it's no different. Let's see, this is from Lisa Campos, the AD for UTSA. It's no different than what I've said, what I've done with all our programs. It's a constant evaluation. It's an evaluation in the totality, not just one year, but all the years. It's an evaluation of not just the wins and loss record, but there are a lot of other things I look at with programs. So we'll continue to evaluate through the season, and that's usually how I operate. Basically, what I read is this ain't changing shit. Like, like, this, is, like this man is still very much not getting renewed, but congrats on winning a little bit more this year. Yeah, there you go. And um yeah, so we'll see. I, I think very I wouldn't be shocked at all. Like UTSA knocks off a team in the tournament. We've we've yeah. known that though. Like we've talked about that. We said UTSA has like these guys that can play basketball 
but they're just again Henson is not a good coach this is not a good foundation they don't have anything to fall back on but you'll get these games where Jordan Ivy Curry and company get hot and mm-hmm. win a game so yeah very annoying uh, North Texas should still probably go like 10 and 8 in conference which considering the, the injuries that they've had is not yeah. terrible so um yeah, anything else on the AAC? Uh, SMU lost to USF, who USF is all of a sudden a freaking juggernaut, 14-1, and one, running away with the conference. Um, so not a bad loss from SMU there. Um, and then what else we got in this? Rice, 5-9, and nine, back-to-back wins, UAB and ECU. Watch out. We need, UC- we need UTSA Rice rematch in the tournament. That's oh, what I need. Okay. I have no clue how that's town possible, match? but like I need them to play in the Those tournament. Because, town match? Yes. I need I need them to play. So um I think that's all the AAC update I have on the men's side. Yeah. Um, uh the women's I mean the only the only update on the women's side is Rice has North Texas and UTSA to finish out the year. So that'll be well, also and Rice just lost, I think. Yeah. I was looking they at did. it. Um, so let me double check on that. But yeah, um, so yeah, they're kind of. I mean, Rice is kind of out of the the women's to win the, the conference. They're kind of out of the picture. But North Texas still within reach. I think they're within one game of Temple. Um, and UTSA is still, of course, trying to fight for seating. They're still within like a half game of basically like fourth right now. Like they're in they're in seventh, but like they're again, everybody has like eight wins, yeah. seven wins, seven losses. So like they're still within striking distance. So we got to kind of figure out kind of keep track of their tournament seating and that as far as uh, that's concerned yeah um i think one maybe the last thing for me uh a mm-hmm. women's kind of like how i was talking about with texas except this is yeah. a lot worse a and women's we've talked about them i think they're missing the tournament and i think it's actually done now i'm not sure what else like they they could win out or you know have a good run in the tournament sure. but uh it's not looking good for Joni Taylor and this AM team after a loss to Auburn on the road. Uh, I believe it was 57 45. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, 57 41. And I know Auburn's a good defense. Like I've, I've, I've watched Auburn give LSU hell, but 57 41 loss. Um, and now they have Tennessee and Alabama um, in their last two games of the season. And if they lose both of those, they're not getting in. If they win only one of those, they still might not get in. They're at six and eight in conference now. Yeah, it's, I mean. <clears throat> this, is this the most disappointing team in Texas? Yeah, I mean, probably if they miss the tournament, then yes, flat out. Um because this is a win now roster, right? Like we kind of expected them, like India Rogers, I don't think is coming back. Um, I think she's out of eligibility. I don't know the status of Aisha Kolobali. Um, but like if I'm Janaya Barker, I don't like you kind of stagnated your production with a better roster. Like, are you looking at this situation going, is this the best place where I can maximize my talent? Because like this time last year, people were talking about her as like a future number three WNBA draft pick right uh or top three um now like the skill set's still there don't get me wrong um but that's back-to-back years of basically doing the same stuff and i don't know man you can you can look across the country and see players making moves and upping their draft stock instantly and again if they don't bring back an india rogers like okay cool if let's say kendall hunter stays healthy okay cool that's that's somebody who should help but like yeah. that's a lot on somebody who hasn't played that much in like two years, right? Um, and like sure, even so, in the know, portal, in the portal, how much better could she have done in the portal? Like next year's roster, how much better of a roster, like talent wise, could you yeah, get yeah. than India Rogers? I mean, so Nia Barker? so I'll say I'll say this. I think what what they're going to hinge on is a lot of these players taking a next step, like a Sydney Bowles. Kylie Marshall, who is a who was a top four star coming out of Texas. Yeah. Um, they have Talia Parker coming in from from summer uh, from South Grand Prairie. So like they're gonna hinge on a lot of players taking a step up that maybe they weren't able to bet on this past year, right? Yeah. Um, but like they don't they may not go get an India Rogers, but they may get somebody like to the level of like a Shaley Gonzalez, 
right? Not necessarily somebody who's going to like completely yeah. change their trajectory, but somebody who is a better fit next to an improving overall team. Um, Cause I agree. Like there's not like a, you know, there's not a Haley Van Lith coming out, right. That's like, Oh, they can just go get her. Um, so yeah. And then also like, let's not act like this isn't the transfer portal area. You're going to have to recruit your players to stay <laughs> uh, the yeah. ones that you do get. And so I'm looking at the roster right now, at least on paper, they'll lose Sahara Jones and it looks like they will lose Aisha Kulabali and then India Rogers. And Lauren, then Ware, Lauren well, Ware as well. No, it says junior on the roster. Oh, I'm sorry. I saw TR yeah. and I, I don't know why I thought I graduated. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's again Rogers, the big one, obviously. Um, but if they can maybe I don't even know if it's like they're gonna have, a lot of players are gonna have to step up, basically. And then they're gonna yeah. have to add maybe one or two start not startable but playable pieces in the transfer portal. It's not easy. Um, but it is, yeah. So it, it, there are questions now, and this is the first time that we've been able to really say that because we kind of gave her the benefit of the doubt last year. Um, we saw what she was doing in the transfer portal at the end of last year. And we're like, okay, cool. Let's, let's keep it rolling. But AM's a program. We talked about it. We were, we were texting last night. Texas is coming in. Oklahoma's coming in. Oh, what you got? <laughs> what you got? Yep. Um, it's not going to get any easier. And so you have to first and foremost, keep Janiah Barker. Um, like you said, I think Barker at this point, I mean, she was recruited by Joni Taylor and she like knows Joni Taylor really well. Like this isn't a situation yeah. where Taylor like inherited her and there's right. like, there's a built up trust there. So I think she could stay, but like, I'm just, I don't know. I think Barker could use different coaching to a degree like a different style of coach maybe uh because nothing's changed in the first two years and i barker's a very very good player like very good player she's gonna she puts up fine numbers but they just can't figure out how to win and i am puzzled at how they can't figure out how to win and it's only going to get harder next year so uh we'll see that i think they're on the outside looking in i think the ncaa puts out their new or the uh, ncaa the the committee puts out their new like top 16 um this coming week and then they'll all the bracketologies will be updated so we'll see but yeah that was it's an interesting situation here uh and i think that's it lamar men's i watched them play mcneese lose yeah. basically at the buzzer um mcneese wins the conference lamar i think drops to nine and six but man that's a good lamar team like that's just a, that's a real solid Lamar team. If McNeese wasn't McNeese this year, I think you'd be looking at Lamar like, you know, with only three losses or four losses this year instead of six. Um, but that McNeese team, I think, is just on a little bit of a different level. But great game in Beaumont. Uh, Lamar fans showed out. It looked like it was a great atmosphere. Uh, Lamar versus you know uh, McNeese is like an hour and a half away from each other, so you get real like battle of the border type stuff. Um, but yeah, great game from Lamar. Just McNeese hit a shot to win it, basically. So, um, and then on the women's side, Lamar women, fourteen and one now, beat A and Corpus Christi, sixty eight, sixty three. Oh, yeah. Juggernaut. All right, you're missing one more news note. North Texas didn't lose again. All right, so I don't know what it, what it is. That that was the only thing I was trying to avoid. Nobody so, else did lose. It wasn't North Texas. Who lost last night? What I now watch? TCU Baylor. Swack. McNeese. Who? Swack. Oh, that's right. <laughs> All right. So for the uninitiated, okay. <clears throat> Prairie View lost to Mississippi Valley State 57 51. Why am I mentioning this? Is because, Bruni, how many wins did Mississippi Valley State have heading into last night? Zero. Absolutely zero. Oh, and 27 heading into February 26th. They are now one and 27, literally the last ranked team in Kempom. 362nd, the Devils, the Delta Devils beat Prairie View. Byron Smith, you are on surveillance watch, my, my, my sir. <laughs> um, I don't think I've ever seen that. I texted you. You have to try to go. Oh, and so, oh, and twenty-seven. 
Like that's not well, just uh there's there that's that's like you roll out of bed and be like, damn, we got a game today. I don't know if I want to play. <laughs> like that's that, that's I, how you do that. And Mississippi Valley State had again, it has the case for all the swag teams, but they ended it with the second toughest non-conference schedule in the country. Uh so those losses are one thing. Uh they yeah. went to overtime with Pacific, you know, they, they had some close games, but a lot of their losses, even in conference play. Are like lost by 24 to Southern, lost by eight to Jackson State, lost by 17 to Alcorn. Like they're they're getting blown out in the sweat. Yeah. And Texas Southern had just beaten them by 21. And now Prairie View comes in and they saw food and they beat them. And the best part to me was the broadcast. I retweeted yeah. it, but did, did you see the broadcast? The the yes, the two guys that were dude, like, they had the thickest accent ever. I loved it. They were all about it. I, oh my God, I need, look, as somebody who just did a broadcast, there's a difference between like a broadcast voice and your regular, I don't care. Dish the broadcast voice. Those dudes sounded awesome. I wanted like, I want more of that. When I listen to a SWAT game, I want to hear that. Yes. Like that's the type of stuff I want to hear. That's the flavor that I want to hear from those type of yeah. programs. And Tech, yeah, they made it so much better. They made it so much better. It was fantastic. Um, I mentioned when te- when I watch Texas Southern games, it's kind of like old heads, but they're clearly Texas Southern fans. Like it's the best. Like you're like, clear. Oh my gosh, Texas Southern fan. Texas Southern did this. Da da da. But it was they they. <laughs> I have I have it up on my Twitter right now. It's like we're only twenty eight point eight away, Andre. Twenty eight point eight seconds. <laughs> they wanted that win so bad, they, especially for like they 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 saw some bad basketball this year man imagine and they got to come out every single game and act like they weren't winless on the season <laughs> like uh, it looked like they were about to cry on the broadcast and i respect it so much cuz they were right? like this is it. this is this is going to go down in history right here man and then they stormed the court afterwards <laughs> i was about to say they actually had like a decent crowd for a winless team <laughs> that was the craziest part <laughs> It was fantastic. So this that's what college basketball is all about, man. Just get oh, some yeah. Mississippi Valley State a win. But Prairie View, we didn't forget about you, all right? That's unacceptable. You ain't escape. I was about to say, you, you ain't escape no, on that. You're not getting out of here, all right? But shout out to Mississippi Valley State um, for getting their first win of the year. And that's it. Now yep, we are done. Now we are done. Um, Texas Southern is doing well. 10-5 and five in conference for those wondering. Right, Johnny Jones time. Yeah, so it's, it's Johnny Jones just got out the rocking chair. Said, All right, <laughs> it's the he has to lean up. It's the gaming, the gaming yeah. meme where you lean up the in your seat. It's like, All right. yeah, went in his closet. Said, "All right, my suits are all still here from the last ten years. <laughs> all right, let's do this thing." And they've won it's three straight change. now, and they got Jackson State, Alcorn, and Prairie View as the last three. So should be they're hitting their stride, H- yeah. hitting their stride. And all right. That's all we got for y'all today. Hope y'all enjoyed the episode. Uh, we'll be back. A uh, big slate of games tonight. Uh, I think the Big 12 plays, and um, we'll see what else there is throughout the week. But, yeah, um, we'll start getting into the bracketology talk as, as well. Started seeing what this – or a conference tournament talk, honestly, now that – after yeah. this week. So, yeah, stay tuned for that. We'll be back on Friday to talk to y'all. Then leave us a five-star rating and review wherever you are listening, Apple, Spotify. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, leave us a like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Uh, We thank you all for joining us, and we will talk to you all later.